Continuing on with the analysis of Bilenium by J.G. Ballard. Now we're going to look at the characters that we see in this short story. John Ward is the main protagonist in this story. Ward is the middle-aged, unmarried protagonist of Bilenium. In the story, he works as a librarian and shares his living space with Henry Rossiter. He is passive compared to Rossiter. This means that Rossiter almost gets up and fights against the government, fights against society, whereas John Ward is passive in his unhappiness. He's unhappy with <clears throat> life in the city, the overcrowded city, but he does nothing about it. He complains about it. Also, Ward is more sensitive to beauty and is more disturbed than Rossiter when the Victorian wardrobe is destroyed to make more space at the end of the story. He despises, hates, detests the greedy landlords who reduce the size of the cubicles so that there is no space for him to walk without stumbling. But by the end of the story, he becomes a mean, penny pinching landlord himself. Penny pinching means somebody who counts all of the pennies, counts all of the little coins, and becomes fixated on every last bit of money that he has. And he becomes this mean, penny pinching landlord himself when he finds, and you can't see it down here, the empty room. <clears throat> Henry Rossiter. He is very different from Ward, even though they are close friends. He's more aggressive in his approach to, to life and to the difficult situation that they find themselves in. And it's him that persuades Ward to let their girlfriends into the spare room. This is a disastrous move because the girls bring in their families too, little by little. And so this vast space becomes just as small and claustrophobic as their cubicles were. Also, Rossiter is not sensitive to beauty and sacrifices the one thing that symbolizes beauty in their lives, the Victorian wardrobe. And he sacrifices this wardrobe to get more space. Language techniques that we can see in this story. The title is important, as it is in all stories and poems. The story describes a situation when the population of the world has grown to the extent that there is no place for people to live normal lives. The space that each person can occupy is regulated by the city council, and it's getting smaller and smaller. Um, Ward and Rossiter remember back to 10 years ago when the cubicle space was bigger than it is now, four, four square meters, and there are rumors that it's going to decrease to even smaller, to three and a half square meters. The, the title Bilenium refers to the time far into the future when overpopulation and not war as we saw earlier, is the threat that, human, that the human race faces. Writer's effect. How does Ballard's writing affect the story and the reader? Well, he, he uses third person narrative throughout. It's very much third person limited because it's not written in the first person I, but it focuses on the main character of Ward. We see things through his eyes. Also, Ballard has chosen words that highlight the cramped cubicles in which people live out their lives. He's also chosen words which highlight the claustrophobia of life in the city. And you can see in the first two pages alone, tens of words that depict 
the claustrophobic atmosphere. There is no privacy and no comfort in this world. And his word choice shows this. Describing Ward's cubicle, the narrator says, partition pressed against his knees and he could hardly move. This gives us a great image of how small and tight the cubicle is. He's literally sitting on his bed and the partition is against his knees. So you can imagine how little space he has and he could hardly move because there was so little room. It would be a good idea if you went back to your old copy books to look at the claustrophobic language that we made notes about when we were studying this, um, this story. We probably found 20 or 30 words together as a class that showed the claustrophobia in this story. So the claustrophobic language, this is the language that I was talking about that we um, that we found in back last year. Also, this has been added to by the year 10 class of this year who are currently studying stories of ourselves. So you can, there's lots of good examples of the claustrophobic language here that Ballard uses raw, bruising crush, squeezed out of existence, packed, shuffling, always full, wrestling, huge crowd, immovably jammed, narrow, booming, never empty, unbearable, the noise was unbearable, the ceaseless press of people. Ceaseless means never stops, jostling jostling with their elbows out like you do in the crowd, reduced him to a state of exhaustion. He was completely exhausted, very, very tired because of the life in this city. The cease, and then you can, there's some longer examples of quotations here and the page numbers as well that go with them. The ceaseless press of people jostling past the window had reduced him to a state of exhaustion. As soon as he saw the advertisement describing the staircase cubicle he had left, like everyone else, he spent most of his spare time scanning the classifieds in the newspapers, moving his lodgings an average of once every two months, despite the higher rental. A cubicle in a staircase would almost certainly be on its own. So even though he's basically living in a, or he, this new cubicle is basically a cupboard under the stairs, so you can imagine how small it is. He's excited about it because he'll be living on his own. He won't have to share his living space with another person. Here we have an example of irony or sarcasm. It's enormous. The perspectives really zoom. No, it's not. It's not enormous at all. Ballard is being sarcastic here. He's making the reader almost uh, question and laugh at the characters, but to the characters it does seem enormous. Manipulating the ceiling was a favourite trick of unscrupulous landlords. So the landlords were making life even worse for the people who lived in this city because they were moving the ceilings to make it look like the room was bigger, but actually it was smaller, so they could get more money. Often locks would occur when a huge crowd at a street junction became immovably jammed. Sometimes these locks would last for two days. Two years earlier, Ward had been caught in one outside the stadium for over 48 hours, was trapped in a gigantic pedestrian jam containing over 20,000 people, fed by the crowds leaving the stadium on one side and those approaching in on the other. This quote describes the time when Ward was stuck in one of those pedestrian 
traffic jams. And you can see the claustrophobic language Ballard uses to portray how uncomfortable and difficult life is. As soon as he saw the advertisement describing the staircase cubicle he'd left, blah blah, despite the high rental, a cubicle on the staircase would almost certainly be on its own. So, an analysis of that quote. John Ward lives in a city that teems, teems means com uh, full to overflowing, with 30 million people, with a million being added every year. He used to share a room with seven other people. The lack of privacy and space used to reduce him to despair. And we know the word despair from Thomas Hardy. Most people were unhappy with their lodgings and were constantly on the lookout for better accommodation. This one that Ward chose seemed promising because he didn't have to share it with anyone, even though it was tiny. And here we have the quote again about him being stuck in a pedestrian jam. Pedestrian jams were one of the features of the dystopian city. Dystopian is a good word to use to describe this story. It means of the future and um, in a society which is very different in which the protagonist lived. The one in which Ward was caught, the pedestrian jam in which Ward was caught involved 20,000 people and it carried on for 48 hours, during which it was impossible to move at will. In spite of such gigantic crowds that were at sports events, people still attended these sports events because it was the only way for well it was one of the only ways for them to get away from the tiny cubicles in which they lived so even though these sports events were just as crowded with massive gigantic crowds people still went because they just wanted to escape from their tiny cubicles Rossiter smiled that's the ultimate argument, isn't it? They used it 25 years ago at the last revaluation re when the minimum was cut from five to four. The ultimate argument that he's talking about is Ward says that it's not possible to make the cubicles smaller. So Rossiter is the protagonist's close friend, as we've seen. Unlike John Ward, he's a realist. He is also sharp and matter-of-fact. Since he works for the government, he hears bureaucratic rumours that the minimum space for a cubicle is going to be slashed from four metres to a mere three and a half. Ward is not ready to believe that they're going to do that, though, because they would need too many adjustments to the existing cubicles, which would have to be shortened by half a metre. And where are you going to get that half a metre Sorry, what, what is going to happen to that half a metre? If, you, if you're going to make it worthwhile, you'd have to move every single cubicle half a metre to the left, for example, so that you can get another cubicle at the end. So actually, it's pointless. But Rossiter reminds him that such reductions have been enforced before, and the city council could well do it again. Again, you can't see that. Apologies. Okay, and this concludes the second video, and a third will be on the way.